Okay, I think we can proceed. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, so we uh, reviewed the assumptions, and then the, the whole goal is to try and say something about um, upper bounds and the, and the proof of upper bounds. Uh, so, if you recall, what is upper bounds? Um, it is uh, uh, one way to state it would be to say that if you look at the sequence of renormalizations that you get for an infinite renormalizable system, uh, or in other words, if you zoom in to a part of this dynamics, uh, the relevant part of this dynamics, that the, the shape of the dynamics or the sequence of renormalizations, that it doesn't degenerate as you uh, scale in more and more, right? So that's kind of one way to state upright bounds. And the whole business of trying to show upright bounds, it revolves around this notion of distortion. which actually came up in some of the other courses. Um, so let me first define what it is for the simplest setting, which is for a diffeomorphism in one dimension. So let's take uh, diffeo on, defined on some interval into hi, the to C1 diffeo. Then its distortion is defined to be the following quantity, which is there a standard notation for distortion? Does any anyone know? Okay, I, I don't know. I've been I've been denoting it like this, but some people don't like it because it looks too much like derivative. But okay, let's stick with this for now. Uh, so the distortion of H. Uh, is defined to be the supremum of all points in the domain of the ratio of the derivatives. Okay, so this is defined to be the distortion. And observe that it's always at least one, but of course it could be arbitrarily large. Uh, also observe that this is exactly equal to 1 if and only if h, well, if and only if the derivative is constant, or in other words, h is an affine map, right? So distortion, it measures how far your map is from an affine map, or in other words, it measures the degree of nonlinearity in your map. Yeah? So it's equal to 1 if and only if h is affine. Okay, so like I said, upright bounds, we're trying to look at a sequence of maps and we're trying to detect whether the sequence degenerates or if it stays uh, tame. Yeah? So let's kind of do an exercise where we consider a sequence of not unimodal maps because maybe that's a little bit harder to visualize. Let's consider a sequence of diffeomorphisms on an interval. On a fixed interval, let's just do zero to one. Sequence of C1 Okay, And let's ask ourselves, how can this kind of map, so this is from 0 to 1, if you have a sequence of these maps, how can this sequence degenerate um, as n goes to infinity? What does it have to do? Um, so this is an exercise, at least for me, is very helpful when trying to navigate the, any argument for distortion. So I kind of like to picture what goes on as this map takes the particles that are distributed along this uh, interval, and then it moves the particles. Yeah? So how can it move it in such a way that you know, the picture gets more and more degenerate? Well, the way to degenerate this map would be to, at some point, let me use red and blue, would be to, well, take this interval and squeeze it way too much at a certain point, right? That would be a kind of degeneration that you can do with a sequence of diffeo. Yeah, so you could maybe squeeze a little bit, this interval a little bit too much there, right? And then in the limits, the derivative here will be equal to zero, which will make it no longer a diffeomorphism. Or you could do something in reverse, which would be to take a point and stretch it way too much. 
stretch this interval way too much, right? And then again, in the limit, this thing will degenerate. Yeah? And notice that if you make an additional assumption that assume that the distortion of H is uniformly bounded by some K, then this kind of picture can't happen. Yeah? So this is kind of a hand wavy argument to prove that if you have a sequence of diffeomorphisms and you have uniformly bounded distortion, then the sequence has to be pre-compact. I don't know if the picture is any more convincing than just saying Azela as coli, but, um, yeah, but this is the way I like to think about it. Uh, the same as quasi-symmetric? Same as quasi-symmetric, bounded distortion? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. So it's two clear years, I don't... Uh, I'm not sure. Um, maybe. The one applies to another. Yeah, so it's the same, I don't know. Um, okay, so, uh, so basically the, the whole business of trying to prove upright bounds is to try and control the distortion of diffeomorphisms. Okay? Uh, so let me restate the upright bounds that I stated for the one-dimensional case and the two-dimensional case last, uh, last lecture. Let me restate it in terms of distortion. Okay? Oh, but actually before I do that, um, let me correct a misstatement that I made last lecture. So last lecture, I kind of started off by saying that um, the renormalization techniques are largely restricted to 1D, and the goal of the course is to try and generalize it to 2D. Uh, that was a kind of an embarrassing misstatement, because of course, there's an enormously large body of work in higher dimensional renormalization um, with some truly remarkable results. Christian has alluded to some of it in his course. Uh, what I really meant was that the Techniques for controlling distortion, as far as I know, is largely limited to one-dimensional cases. That's what I think. And the goal, the actual goal, is to take these techniques for controlling distortion and generalize it to 2D. Well, okay. there is, there is a far corner in high dimension. Hmm. Okay, so there are... There are calls it distortion. Okay, so then just the goal is to learn more about distortion techniques in 2D. Let me not say anything about, you know... Um, what has what has been done? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me not even bother writing it. Okay. So good. Uh, all right. So let me restate upright bounds. Restatement upright bounds. Bounds. Okay. So I'll start with one D. So in one D, we have the unimodal map from an interval into itself which is C2 unit model. And we assume that it is infinitely normalizable. Okay. So what does this mean? It means that if you have this interval like this, and you have your map, unit model map on this interval, then there has, exists a unique critical point of quadratic type. And elsewhere, it's a diffeomorphism. Right? So the critical point maps to the critical value, which then goes somewhere else, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So this is a unimodal map, and we say that it's infinitely normalizable. Um, well, last time we phrased it in terms of periodic intervals containing the critical point, but of course an equivalent way to define infinite normalizability would be to do it at the critical value. Right? So let me actually just relocate by applying the map once because it's actually more convenient if we start at the critical value rather than at the critical point. Okay? So we say that this unimodal map is infinitely normalizable if for all n greater than or equal to 1, there exists a periodic Rn periodic subinterval, let me call it Jn1, which contains the critical value and is contained in the interval. Yeah? So the picture looks something like this. So for all n, there exists an interval, which I'm calling Jn1. 1 stands for the fact that it's containing the first image of the critical point. Okay. So it has this interval, and then if you iterate it Rn minus 1 time, or up to Rn minus 1 time, then it's going to jump around the phase space. 
Yeah. Uh, okay. And then at the last moment, at R n minus one time, it's going to finally land for the first time to an interval containing the critical point. And then if you so this is f r n minus one time restricted to j n. Okay, so if you restrict to this tiny interval, then it's going to jump around, it's going to map diffeomorphically, right? Up to the final moment, Rn minus 1, when it maps onto the critical point, and then you finally return to where you came from by applying this folding map, right? which will fold like this. So this will be one application. So this gives you a full cycle of this. Periodic interval. Yes? Just a silly remark. So Rn uh, goes to infinity here. Yeah, Rn actually goes to infinity very fast. Rn is at least 2 to the n. Right? Because each time you can renormalize, the period has to grow by at least a factor of 2. Right? That's the minimum period that you can have. Um, so it goes to infinity um, very exponentially fast. So this is the picture that you have for all n. Yeah, so they're a smaller and smaller periodic interval with larger and larger period. But one nice thing is that if you apply the map period number of times minus 1, then all of those iterates, it never hits the critical point. So all in the intermediate steps, this map right here, which I'll call Hn, is a diffeomorphism. Okay? And then only at the last step, you apply something which is not a diffeomorphism. Okay, so the statement, restatement of operator bounds would be there exists some constant k less than infinity such that the distortion of these sequence of diffeomorphisms coming from higher and higher renormalization, those have uniform uh, distortion bound by k. That distortion of Hn is uniformly bounded by k. So this is one way to state if you want Okay. Well, then you can get the actual renormalization map or the first return pre-renormalization -re -pre map just by taking Hn. So note, note, um, the pre-renormalization map, which is f iterated r n times, is nothing more than just iterating by Hn and then composing by some fixed map H, F, right? So if you can prove that H ends to not degenerate, then of course, applying F one more time is not gonna do any serious harm, I think. Yeah, so this is a pre-bound in the one we uh, Questions about this? Okay, if not, let's go to 2D. So 2D, the picture is, the statement is more complicated, um, but if you think about it, I mean, it's going to be very similar to, similar in spirit to, it's, it's the closest analog that you can think of to the statement, corresponding statement in 1D. So let me make this, that's what I'll first down to 2D, and 2D. The statement is as follows. Um, okay, so again, we have this critical orbit. So we have the critical value here, and let's say we have the critical point here. C naught. Like this. Oops. And uh, what we saw was that the critical point has a nice center manifold, like this, and the critical value has a nice stable manifold like this, right? And it comes from the uniformization of the backward orbit of the critical point. So there's some regular neighborhood around the critical point, some fixed regular neighborhood of the critical point, which we call u naught, and some fixed regular neighborhood around the critical value, which we call u naught. Right? And if you apply the map once from the critical point to the critical value, f, well, you go from this picture to this picture, and the transition corresponds to, well, you can normalize it so that it looks like a Henon map. Yeah. So you can normalize this picture by applying the linear, uh, the uniformizing map, phi naught and phi one. These are all just fixed maps, right? We're not talking about any kind of renormalization yet. But you can 
like this, so that the center manifold, which is some C2 curve in your space, becomes straight horizontal line, like so. And the stable manifold, which is just some C2 curve, becomes a straight vertical manifold, like this. Okay, so this is something that we have just from the definition of regular critical point. Yeah? All right, so now comes the renormalization part, uh, and the statement is this. So, we can, uh, so the renormalization is defined in terms of topological disks that are containing either the critical point or the critical value, let's say critical value. Yeah? So we have the sequence of smaller and smaller periodic disks containing the critical value, which returns to itself after Rn iterates. Right? So that's the assumption, infinite renormalizability assumption. So operator bounds states that we can choose these topological disks to have a very nice shape. So we can choose it to be this topological rectangle which extends all the way to the top and bottom of U1, like so. And furthermore, if you go from here, so this is DN1, this is the periodic disk containing the critical value. So then if you iterate this thing, it comes back to itself under Rn iterates, right? So if you iterate it Rn minus one time, this is going to go here, and it's gonna look Okay, that's not supposed to be wider, but let me draw it wider. Okay, this is dn rn. So you iterated it rn minus one time to get to that point. Okay, it's part of the statement of upper bounds that when you iterate it by the period minus one time, it looks like that rectangle. So it looks like a flat rectangle aligned with the center. And then if you uniformize this picture, it's going to look like a straight rectangle containing the origin, like this. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take straight vertical lines in this picture. Just ex genuine vertical lines. Genuine vertical, actually, ah, ah, red maybe was a bad choice, but okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, so you take the straight vertical foliation, you pull it up by, this, uh, by the inverse of this thing, you're going to get some thing, some kind of vertical foliation in this picture. And what we claim is that if you pull this foliation back by this iterate, then you're going to get nice vertical foliation over your topological disk, like so. And then you're going to uh, map it by a phi one. So it's going to map to something nice and vertical down here, yeah. but not necessarily straight vertical. Okay, so it doesn't actually uh, look exactly like the stable manifold. But then what we can do is we can take this vertical manifold and then we can straighten it by some map, which now depends on the level of renormalization. So we can define this map phi for psi n on this rectangle which straightens the vertical foliation to actual genuine vertical foliation. So this becomes an actual rectangle. And the vertical foliation that we got by taking vertical foliation in this picture and pulling it back by the dynamics becomes actual vertical foliation. Okay, everyone following me so far? Yeah? So it extends the original very short. Well, extend, I mean, it's what we get by pulling back, right? Because you can kind of think that uh, when you iterate backwards, there's this expansion along the vertical direction, right? So it takes these very short arcs and stretches it out into a very long vertical foliation over the critical value. Uh, and part of the claim is that this map, which straightens the vertical foliation, this converges super exponentially fast to identity. And the second statement is that if you look at this map, going from here to there, by going here and then iterating and then going down, doing this, observe that it takes straight vertical foliation to straight vertical foliation. All right, so this map, which I'll call Hn, has to be of the form Hnx, in the first coordinate, so the first coordinate just depends on the x coordinate, and the second coordinate has to be something which I'll call enxy. 
Okay, so here's the last bit of the statement, which is that Here, or what you no, 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 no. So I have to, I have to, yeah, I have to conclude. Um, so first of all, we have this picture. We have this for all n. Okay, that's the first part of the statement. Second part of the statement is that this y dependence it decays super exponentially fast. So e n c two is less than lambda to the, let's say, 1 minus epsilon to Rn. Okay. So as you go from here, uh, no, as you go from here to there, there's this strong contraction, which actually corresponds exactly with the number of times you iterate it, right? Because you iterate it f Rn times, and the Lyapunov exponent is lambda along the vertical direction, so it's actually contracting exactly like you would expect. Yeah, uh, and the last statement is that this horizontal, so in the vertical direction, it's just contracting, right, by some map, and in the horizontal direction, uh, we have uniformly bounded distribution. So this is the statement of a pipe bounds. Uh, yeah. You have that, uh, in addition, requirement that psi n uh, converges to identity? Or this is oh, okay. So I guess that's an additional point. So this is the fourth point. And uh, just to clarify, so on this uh, image under five one, uh, so the vertical uh, lines of the origin does not need to be yeah, exactly, exactly the stable manifold. It will approach the stable manifold exponentially fast. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so someone, I, I think Natalie asked, um, or someone, asked uh, what kind of rescaling that we should do for the sequence of renormalizations for this 2D map. So basically we do, at, once we get to this point, we can just scale affinely. Right? But you see that before you do this affine scaling, you should do this one non-fixed, non-linear um, change of coordinates, which turns the, just this kind of curved stable manifold to actual straight vertical manifold. Okay, so that's the kind of the only nonlinear part in the change of coordinates. Okay, uh, so that's the statement of our pipe bounds. Any questions? So could you write what will be the formula for renormalization from this picture? Oh, the formula? Uh, no, it's not so nice. Okay. It's not so nice. Um, but uh, so once you have this, then you can actually massage phi and phi one so that it looks exactly like this. So okay, so. After, uh, after changing, uh, after modifying a little bit, a little bit, you get that the renormalization of F looks like um, H N X squared minus um, minus lambda. Uh, e n x y x. Yeah, this. After massaging a little bit. Okay. So this is a diffio, which when you square it becomes a unimodal map. This thing goes to zero. Right? So this is kind of, it shows that you have this renormalization convergence to this 1D system. So I have. Uh, no, Tw uh, 20 oh, yeah. minutes? Okay. okay. All right. So let me say something about the proof. So how do you control distortion? Um, so let me tell you um, the, the key techniques, uh, the key tools used to control distortion in the 1D setting, and then I'll just give you a flavor of how to adapt it to a two-dimensional setting. Yeah? Um, and then, and then uh, probably I'll run out of time. Okay, uh, so controlling distortion, two key techniques. Um, and let's go back to 1D. So we have this kind of picture in 1D. So this is I, and we have this unimodal map, one dimensional unimodal map. Um, this is C1, C0, and we have this sequence of 
periodic intervals, which when you iterate Rn minus one time, it'll jump around diffeomorphically on the phase space until finally it lands on the interval containing the critical point, and then you do one more to get back to where you started. Yeah, so this is the setup. Okay, so how should we control the distortion of this intermediate diffeomorphism, which we're calling H? Okay, so the trick is to use the following two key techniques. Actually, before I do the two key techniques, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, digest this picture a little bit. So we started with this periodic interval containing the critical point. Uh, let me label its images by the index. So one image of JN1 will be JN2. And then I iterate one more time, this will be JN3. And then I iterate one more time, JN4, then all the way up to JNRN. Okay, so you have this cycle of periodic intervals laid out on your phase space, right? One of them contains the critical point, one of them contains the critical value. Okay. Uh, so then what we want to do is we want to control the distortion of the iterates, Rn minus 1 iterates of f, starting from your initial um, interval Jn1, right? Okay, so here's a trick is that if you apply the log to this distortion, then this becomes sub-additive. The amount of distortion that you pick up by starting with this interval and iterating a bunch of times, Rn minus one times, is actually bounded from above by adding up all the distortions that you pick up at each step in the intermediate uh, orbit. Okay, so this distortion is actually equal to applying f once to the ith image of Jn. Um, so log of the distortion of this thing as i go from 1 to Rn minus 1. No. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so we have this sub-additive property. Yeah? So, instead, uh, so this basically, this uh, inequality, it turns um, the amount of distortion that you pick up over time for this map to amount of distortion that you pick up over space, right? Because you, uh, instead of looking at how much distortion you pick up when you run the time for Rn amount of time, instead you're looking at the distortions that you pick up at each step along the way over space, right? And the nice thing about 1D is that total amount of space that you have is uniformly bounded by 1, right? Because you're, on an, or you're fixed on an interval of length 1 the whole time. Yeah? Okay, so here are the two techniques, which I'll mention. Two techniques. So the first one is called Dandroa Lemma. And the second one is called Cover Distortion Theory. And the idea between, behind these two techniques is as follows. So what you can do is you can fix, so you have this critical point, fix some neighborhood around this critical point. Let's call it U, U naught. Okay, so fix some neighborhood around this critical point. Then something that we remarked on in first lecture is that as long as you stay some fixed neighborhood away from the critical point, the derivative has a lower bound, uniform lower bound, right? Uh, so what that means is that um, you can um, basically turn this, uh, okay, so Dandroa lemma, it controls, let me put, controls distortion um, outside some fixed neighborhood U. And the cover distortion theorem, it controls distortion inside you. you know. So you apply two different kind of analytic techniques depending on whether you're iterating close to the critical point or you're iterating sufficiently far away from the critical point. So if you're iterating away from the critical point, then Dandroa lemma tells us that actually this, the distortion that you pick up 
is commensurate with the total length of the intervals that you're looking at. So, this uh, can be formulated as follows. So, if you look at the total contribution to the distortion from applying your map on places which stays away from the critical orbit, so if you add up all those contributions to distortion, so if you add up all the contributions to log distortion of f, j, n, i, so that j, n, i does not intersect a neighborhood of the critical orbit, then this is uniformly bounded by some constant times the total length of all these intervals. So you take the sum of j and i. So this is what Danjuan Lama tells us. And actually, the proof of that is very elementary. You can just do it. If it's C2, then it's just an exercise in calculus. Okay, as long as you have some uniform bound on the, on the uniform lower bound on the derivative of your diffeomorphisms, then you can show that for C2 maps, the, uh, yeah, that the total contribution to distortion away from the critical point is just bounded by their total length. And like I said, their total length is always bounded uniformly above by some uniform constants of order one. Yeah. So this is Danjua Lemma. And then there's this cover distortion theorem, which is more sophisticated, and it deals with the fact that near the critical orbit, the correct geometry to look at is not Euclidean geometry, which is what you use to control distortion using the Dendroit lemma, but actually hyperbolic geometry on the line. Um, this, I don't think I can get into to any extent. So let me just comment a little bit about the Dendroit lemma. Okay, how to adapt this kind of idea of looking at um, distortions that you pick up when you're away from the critical point by the total length of the arcs. Okay, so I'll go here. So let's see. Okay, so uh, actually, it's the uh, Danjua on curves in 2D. So it's actually kind of trivial to um, generalize the draw lemma to um, smooth curves lying in two dimensional space. So you can do it in the following way. So let's take some curve, um, gamma R2, uh, C2 curve. Right? And let's parameterize gamma by its arc point. Right? So let's uh, phi gamma be the parameterization of this curve, the arc length parameterization. And the draw lemma states the following. The draw in 2D. Okay, so let's look at the. Uh, so we have some curve like this. Gamma. Uh, let me call it gamma naught. So this is our initial curve like this. And um, we map it by f to some curve like this. Um, let's call it gamma. Yeah. Okay, so then the draw lemma in 2D states the following that um, um, if you look at the distortion of F restricted to gamma, that this is uniformly bounded by something of the order of the length of the curve itself. Um, assuming some hypothesis, if um, gamma has bounded term. Okay, so 
So this is Donjuala Lama and Tutti. Okay, so I wrote this backwards. So if you have this curve, right, on which you map by your, your function, so if this thing has bounded turning, then the distortion that you feel along this curve by the action of this map is bounded by um, the length of this curve. Gamma naught. Gamma naught. Where distortion actually, I should define it. Okay, so the distortion is, so distortion of F restricted to gamma naught is by definition the distortion of, so this is parameterized by arc length by phi gamma naught, right, it's by some interval from zero to the length of gamma naught, right? So this is a parameterization from 1D to some curve in two-dimensional space, and you have to draw this more curvy, like this, right? And then you apply F to get this new curve, which we can also parameterize by its arc length, and we call it phi gamma one. So that parameterizes it from zero to the length of gamma one. So the distortion of F restricted to gamma naught, so the way it distorts the positions of the particles that lie along this curve, uh, is defined to be the distortion of the one-dimensional map here. Yeah. So you go, you start from a 1D interval, you go up, map, and go down. Actually, this should be pointing that way. Oh, okay. So it's the map phi gamma naught composed with f composed with phi gamma one inverse. So that's by definition the distortion. And we can say that as long as this has bounded turning, that the distortion that you feel along this curve is proportionate to the length of this curve, which is precisely the point of Danjo lemma, would be to say that. Um, yeah, the distortion is controlled by the total length, which in the setting of renormalization theory in 1D, you have this nice uniform bound. Yeah. Um, okay, I have five minutes. Good. So, so what has to have bound in turning? Gamma zero or? Gamma zero. Okay. Thank you. Gamma zero has bound turning. And by, what do I mean by bounded turning? I mean that, well, okay, so if you look at the tangent vector, the unit tangent vector along this, uh, along this arc, the turning, the speed of the turning has to be uniformly bounded. That's what I mean. Okay. So then this distortion is bounded by the variation in F and also the amount of turning in the in the angle. Right? But if you assume that the variation in F and the turning in this gamma is uniformly bounded, then you can there's just one-to-one -one correspondence between the distortion and the total length of the arc that you're acting on. So, let me just try to highlight why um, this kind of 1D technique becomes very tricky to apply in 2D set, right? So what makes 1, 2D much more difficult than 1D? So, pro, uh, two issues in 2D. So what we would like to do, so let me first point out kind of an obvious issue, which would be that, well, which would be this hypothesis, which we didn't have in 1D, right? Because in 1D, when you're acting on the intervals, it stays interval, right? There's no geometry to an interval, it's just flat. So you don't have to worry about this kind of turning that happens under your dynamics. But in 2D, you have the flexibility to take maybe an initially nice curve, but if you start iterating by your dynamics, maybe it becomes kind of a very horrible curve. This. Yeah, so then that t gives you a breakdown of this kind of control that you have. Okay? So in order to apply this kind of Dunjol lemma in 2D setting, you have to control what the curves look like when you iterate by your dynamics. Yeah? And the second problem, and this for us uh, at the beginning was a more scary problem, um, which actually kind of made me think that you know, upper, upper bounds might not be true in 2D. Which is that in 1D, if you take the renormalization interval, right, and you're looking at the distortion that you pick up by iterating by the period, right, all these intervals are disjoint and they're all on an interval of total size one. 
Right, so the total length is uniformly bounded. I said this before, but I'll, let me say it again for emphasis. Yeah. So, but here in 2D, that's not the situation because what we have is, let's say, a realization domain like this, right? And let's say we're trying to see how much distortion is felt along this horizontal cross section. Yeah? And it would be nice if we can get some uniform bound as we iterate this thing. To the final destination. It would be nice if we can get some uniform bound on the total diameter of all of these images. Yeah? But the problem is that in 2D, you can have this kind of phenomenon where, yeah, all these disks are disjoint, but they can look, they can start to do this kind of business, right? So where are you? This thing maybe goes there, and then it goes there, and then it goes there, and it goes there, and it goes there, and then maybe at the end it goes there. So this arc now has no restriction on what the total length has to be. Okay, so this is a second issue that might come up. This kind of stacking, you have more room to stack the diameter in order to make your uh, make your um, distortion blow up. Yeah. So this is these are the kind of challenges that you have in two D. And let me just say a word about how to try to control uh, these issues uh, in our setting. Entropy yeah? zero then. Entropy zero then. <laughs> It's easier? No, I think it's easier? Yondin theorem. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, Yondin theorem, I think um, we also kind of thought about this, but I think. Because entropy yeah, that's right. Infinity, then you don't Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, we did think about Yondin theorem, but I thought that maybe like it wasn't strong enough to get us, get us what we wanted. Let me just say this, okay? Uh, so, for problem one, so just to relate to the whole discussion that we had about. The same theory and the nice regularity structure that we have over the critical orbit. So to deal with one, what you have to think of, so for one, uh, you can kind of think that this curve, which is coming from taking a horizontal cross section of your uh, renormalization domain, uh, you can think of this as being the center manifold of your critical value, okay? So in order to control how it curves around as you iterate forward, what you have to do is you have to control the backward regularity at the intermediate steps of uh, within your, yeah, as, you, as you're iterating forward, okay? So as you iterate forward, the center curve, as you saw in the picture, it does start to spin around. Right? But we have to really understand how that spin takes place, and we have to control how much it spins in order to try and get some kind of nice estimate on the distortions that you pick up. This is very hand wavy, but I just want to give you a flavor. Okay? So in order to prevent this kind of thing uh, from um, destroying the application of the Andrew lemma, you really need to control how the backward regularity of your, of your set, how that deteriorates. Uh, because of the critical orbit, yeah? And here, for number two, uh, what you have to use is the forward regularity, right? Because you have this kind of picture. So you want to try and prevent this kind of stacking of the renormalization domains, right? So the way we do this uh, in our setting is we say that, well, if, let's say, this point is forward regular, well, then it has a nice vertical stable manifold like this. And this will prevent these domains well, two different renormalization domains cannot intersect at the stable manifold. So this, so the picture that we have, we can't have this kind of picture if we can guarantee some kind of forward regularity. The picture that we actually have to have is something that looks like this, right? Because the stable manifold kind of separates out these domains. So it prevents the center manifold from stacking on top of each other. Okay, so this is the second kind of point that I wanted to say, is that uh, for number two, you really have to control the forward regularity of this thing. Okay, I think uh, that's um, basically all I wanted to kind of say about the proof, and sort of the last question that I kind of wanted to ask this audience, because this is, uh, I'm presenting this talk during the, the workshop on dynamics and dimension, is what is the, 
uh, Hausdorff dimension. of lambda if f is uniform. Okay, and then Mark will tell me that he knows. What this is. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I think this actually is not, I hope, uh, obvious. Yeah? So uh, for unimodal maps, we have kind of a complete control of the geometry. So we know exactly what all the stable manifolds look like and what all the central manifolds look like. So I would like to know if that's enough to compute the Hausdorff dimension of this two-dimensional object. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, not quite the same. So I, uh, so we mostly use the one for uh, real dynamics. Yeah. Cross ratio. Yeah, using cross ratios. That's right, using cross ratios. And here, in fact, you discuss the boundary variation. Yeah, naturally, yes. You replace it by strong ellipses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any more questions? Yeah? <laughs> Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, right, so I think, I think the way it works is um, it's difficult to have like a nice picture for it because I think you get a different picture for the ordering for each different um, height in the, in the family. So if for each different B, you get a different ordering. Um, so I don't know if there are any papers that analyzes you know, kind of um, what happens to this ordering as you increase the Jacobian. Um, but pictures are possible. Like, the only thing I know is um, Di Xing, the one who showed me this kind of picture with the, with the intersection of the two infinitely normalizable locus. Uh, yeah, he showed me um, that if you get to higher, uh, um, higher Jacobian, the ordering is flipped. Uh, and there are techniques that you can use to try and analyze how this is done, but I don't know if there's anything that's written, um, you know, which is available on archive or something. Yeah. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Okay. <laughs> and a coffee break into the next Presumably, if you change the parameterization here, you change the things up to the scalar or constant or something. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's just yeah, a full yeah. around, you said it's all reverse. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's right, yes. So, right. you change the, yeah. Okay. So, uh,